Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Elgin and I'm a presenter on uh, BT Sport. Welcome to our Women uh, in Sport webinar today and what happens to be International Women's Day and what better way to spend an hour of it than with our fantastic panel here, brought together with the help of the RPA to celebrate women's role, uh, growth, achievement and work in sport. And what a panel it is. Generally, guys, I'm looking at you and I feel so honoured to have been asked to host today. And um, so a quick intro to the four guests um, because there's quite a lot we want to cover over the next hour or so. Um, I am a little starstruck, if I'm honest. Having Dame Catherine Granger on the panel with five Olympic medals. She is Britain's most decorated female Olympian. She's Britain's most successful female rower and the only female athlete in any sport to gain medals in five consecutive Olympic Games. Um, she's currently chair of UK Sport 2 and we're delighted to have her with us uh, today. Lovely to meet you, Catherine, albeit uh, virtually. Now, when I have had the pleasure of meeting and working alongside on more than one occasion is England rugby star Emily Scarrett. She's a World Cup winner, she's a Grand Slam winner, she's been to Commonwealth Games, Rio Olympics, and was also named World Rugby's Women's Player of the Year in November 2019. She's also a very, very good pundit. We often have um, pitch side with us on BT Sports. Good to see you, Emily. Now, um, my daughter is in the other room, and if she knew that our next panellist was on here, she'd be straight in here. Kadeen Corbin is a netball star, Commonwealth Game Gold medal winner. She's amassed more than 70 caps for the Vitality Roses and is currently enjoying her third successive season with Saracens Mavericks in the Super League alongside sister Sasha, who we could have asked actually to come on. We could have had more of you wonderful people along with us. But thanks for joining us, Kadeen. Great to see you. And finally, World Cup winner and England cricketer Alexander Hartley. After making a Rodi debut in 2016 against Pakistan, Alex went on to be a member of the team who won the Cricket World Cup in July 2017. She's now also turned her hand very successfully to, uh, to punditry and hosts a No Balls podcast where she discusses her experience um, on and off the field. And we look forward to hearing some of those uh, today, Alex. Ladies, welcome and thank you so much for your time. We super appreciate it. Right, let's start at the beginning then um, and go back to almost how you guys started on your sporting journey and maybe what opportunities were gifted to you as young girls and also maybe what obstacles were put in front of you because you were female I think that's a pretty you know it's a pretty good place maybe to start the growth of, of women in sport and where we are now so Catherine from when you started your your sporting journey as a, as a child as a as a young woman what are the main changes you've seen just in terms of attitude and and maybe opportunities provided for, for girls yeah I mean when I was you know when I was growing up when I was really young um I I wasn't particularly aware of blockers or challenges at that point you know i I mean, when dad were really supportive, I had a big sister who kind of, you know, barreled away forward and I followed behind doing all the stuff she did. Um, I had brilliant, brilliant teachers at school, you know, I in all the kind of all the people who sort of are the volunteers that make sports so special um, was was all amazing. And then um, it wasn't really until I started rowing and that wasn't until I was in university mm -hmm. that I was taking it in any way kind of really serious and I started kind of back in the 90s uh, in my sport and although women's rowing had always been around it just wasn't in any way as successful as the men's side so it was the men's name that were kind of you know really well known you know, Sir Steve Redgrave and Sir Matthew Pinson and all these you know the big big superstars of our sport and they you know they got all the headlines they got all the stories they got all the sponsorship but it's because they got all the success you know they really really earned it the hard way and the women's owner kind of just hadn't had the same input from from the coaching side from the support side um and one of the biggest game changers probably for us was um when the national lottery came in to support the olympic and paralympic sports it, it really equalized everything so everything was done on merit rather than sort of gender so all the money went out to the men's and women's side equally and we saw our first sort of breakthrough in the Sydney Olympics in 2000 and that was the first medal we'd won as a women's team and it and it really transformed women's rowing because I remember doing one of my first interviews uh and there was a guy who was there I can't remember where he was from and he was just like we didn't know women rowed and you know like almost like you know we'd only just come into being as as a rowing species so I think as soon as you know we had kind of slightly financial backing but also then success then everything came together after that and there's a lot more um, publicity a lot more interest and we saw that kind of Olympiad after Olympiad get better and better and probably 2012 was was the one that really exploded for women's Olympic and Paralympic sports where just there was success across the board and suddenly all the women's sport was known throughout the games and that was that was the exciting time but it was about 20 year change that happened. 
It's interesting you saying, isn't it, that, that somebody told you I didn't know women's sport, or women road, because I think it almost takes a long, long time, unfortunately, for thought patterns and social norms or what's considered to be social norms to, to change. So, um, Emily, did you suffer any prejudice when, when you were a girl wanting to play what was largely seen as a, as a, as a male sport, I guess? Yeah, and unfortunately, still a little bit now. Um, I think it's it's come a hell of a long way. I first started playing when I was five. That meant that um, I was part of a, a junior boys team. Um, so I was the only girl, <clears throat> excuse me, part of my my team. Um, all of my friends were off doing, you know, lots of other things. It was it was kind of tough. I suppose I was quite stubborn. That it didn't bother me. But lots of girls came, lasted a couple of weeks, and, and disappeared again because they didn't enjoy playing with the boys essentially. Um, but then once I was 12 years old, I was able to join a girls club um, and things have come a long way now. But, but back then we often had to join up with two or three other clubs in the kind of local area to get enough girls to then travel probably the other side of the county um, in order to actually get a game. So now it's so much better. There's, you know, girls clubs or sections at most clubs. Um, they don't have to travel as far to play games. Just the numbers are, are much bigger. Um, but yeah, it was to start with, it was like, or oh, who, who's that girl on that team? Let's not pass to that girl. Then they realise that you actually can catch and they do pass you the ball. So you, you kind of go through the whole whole range of things like that. But um, yeah, as I say, women's rugby is in a pretty good place at the moment. Um, we're still kind of fighting against some of those old school ter- stereotypes. But um, yeah, we've definitely come a long way. And Kadeen, obviously you've made it in a sport that, that's seen as predominantly female. So I'm just wondering how your experiences differ do you think your your route to the top was was made easier in some way or because of it or maybe tougher I don't know um I wouldn't say it was easy because getting to the top it's easy to get into teams but it's hard to stay in um but I was not necessarily a netballer uh to start with like I did gymnastics from the age of three to 12 so my whole younger age was never to do with a ball sport I did not like ball sports (laughs) at all um, the only reason why it got in there because my mum played and then my sister played and watching them consistently on the weekend it's like oh I want to have a go mm-hmm. um, so I just ended up just having a go and trying and then enjoying it and then just you know it just progressed from there and I know it's the number one female sport in the country but we still haven't got the same publicity as you know the male sports in this country I think when I was growing up, I didn't see netball on the TV um, at all until I was actually in the team. It started to get more frequently um, on a weekly basis um, on TV, but I didn't know any when it comes to like idols, looking at people who played netball. I didn't know anything. I just knew I could play and however I get there is how I was going to get there. So um, I'm grateful now that it's it's seen across the board now. So it's, um, yeah, it's been a a long one but we're getting there and we're still getting there <laughs> yeah, absolutely and, and I definitely would like to speak tonight about kind of media coverage you know of women's sport that's definitely a topic I'd like to speak to, to you guys about um Alex I had a good friend who played um cricket for England many moons ago who I'm obviously much older than you and so is my friend um but when we were at school she was the only girl that played cricket the only girl I knew that played cricket and now there are thousands and seemingly opportunities for them to do so and the pathway for them to be successful seems to be on an even keel to to those offered to the boys from a young age would you go along with that yeah I think it's it's definitely got better even when I first started playing cricket at school I had no female friends because everyone was like well who's this chick who's wanting to do PE with the boys why does she want to go and play cricket and I was sort of seen as like the weirdo at school that wanted to play a boys sport um but yeah, it's definitely, you, you go to schools now, primary schools, secondary schools, and, and cricket is sort of seen as a, a an inclusive sport for everybody. And, and yes, they probably separate the two genders just because the boys bowl a lot faster and hit the ball harder. But um, yeah, it's definitely more inclusive now. It's, it still has got a long way to go. I still turn up to play men's cricket and everyone's like, well, that team's rubbish. They've got a girl. Um, <laughs> but it, it is it's getting a lot better and it's so much better than it used to be. Um, I was never lucky or obviously good enough to play sport at a level like you guys. But I remember when I left uni and I wanted to get get into sports journalism and someone told me that I was too young, too blonde and I wore too much makeup to be a rugby presenter. 
I'm not young anymore, I know, but I'm still a blonde and I still wear a lot of makeup and I managed to do it. And I was just wondering if if anyone ever told you that, that you know, you wouldn't achieve your goal or even that you had to maybe lower your expectations. Catherine, we'll go to you first. I'm sure you didn't become the athlete that you are by lowering aspirations. Or people uh, no. Do you know what I mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, I don't think I ever felt anyone... Uh sort of deliberately tried to stop me or advise me away from it um but I think I think what's really I mean probably every, everyone here on the call has done incredible things and uh and there's some periods in your in your kind of career where sometimes you're the only one who believes it you're the only one who believes it's possible mm -hmm. and and you have to really really rely on yourself and then there's other times when possibly you don't think it's possible and you, you need to sort of help and support to get there and I think in the, the brilliant experiences I've kind of got through sport is um, there is a moment when whether it's a deliberate person saying you shouldn't be doing this or you can't do this um, or sometimes I mean we've all you know had our careers in the in the public eye as well where other you know the media or you know social media people have incredible opinions all the time and when I sort of went on to my final Olympics there was you know certainly a, 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 a some voices saying just a mistake just don't do it I mean, you know, you were told you're too young at that point. I've been told I was too old <laughs> and had been out for too long and stuff. And, and at that point, you kind of, I think you learn so much about yourself when you are really faced with the, the sort of the door is closed and what you're going to do now moment. And, and you kind of have to dig deep to get yourself out. Um, but the other thing I've loved about sport is, you know, the flip side, when you really are struggling with how on earth are you going to get through this? There's so many other people you can lean on. And I just, I, you know, We've all been lucky to be in team sports and there's incredible support and help you get through those dark times. And I've, and I've loved that. And I think there's always this, hopefully less now, but there used to be a sort of thing people would go, God, especially in women's sort of team sports, it must be really, you know, be competitive and must be really a sort of nasty side. And, you know, I've only ex experienced incredible support and help and people sort of digging you out of the really dark days from the people I've, I've sort of worked and trained and competed with. And that's kind of, there's definitely days when you're told it's not possible. And then that's when you either rely on yourself or rely on the people around you to get out of it. And I, and, you know, even when sports behind you, I think you carry that with you, that kind of training you've got, that experience you've got, that, that world you've lived in, that stays with you forever. Alex, in cricket, um, do you as, as female cricketers feel like you have to constantly defend your sport? Because like, I love, I love your Twitter. Genuinely, you make me laugh. Um, there, there was, I had to go back to it today, actually, and there was one that you posted a, a while ago where you said, I've got it written down here, men are so bad at cricket, they should go back to doing manual labour. That was one of my favourites. Um, and then another one was, um, well, actually, you can tell us, actually. Do you, is it exhausting having to defend your sport all the time, or do you see it more of as a, of a you know, vocation now? Do you know what? I just, it really infuriates me, because if you work in an office, you don't, you don't say the woman's crap at their job or <laughs> because there's a male that's doing the same job. So why, why do people say women's sport is rubbish when they, they haven't watched it? They might see a drop catch or somebody getting out in, in a way that they shouldn't. But the men make mistakes as well. So on my social media, I point out the men's mistakes saying they should get equal pay. Ha ha ha. I do that to my husband daily. Maybe I should start doing that on social media as well. Because it just it just really winds me up. I just don't think there's any need for these trolls to sort of say women's sports rubbish when when it when it isn't. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I'm sure we've we've all you know we're all, well, most of us on this call, if not all of us, have have had that. And and I think it's it's almost important, isn't it, that we do kind of stand up and and, and stick up for ourselves and each other. Because Kadina, I, I want to ask you about. I don't know if you saw. I'm sure you heard of the recent. Um, uh, in, in recent news, Simone Biles, the, the Olympic gymnast, she called out ESPN to, to delete that goat tweet. Have you heard about it? So, like, basically, I heard you know, about it, but I haven't actually read it. Yeah. So, what it was was ESPN. Um, they put this tweet out, and there were pictures, basically, of fantastic male sportsmen with a tagline "Goat greatest of all time," and it had like Brady there, Muhammad Ali, Michael Jordan, and there wasn't one female um, athlete standard. there. That is standard. That is annoying. And, and standard. <laughs> yeah, and I just, you know, I just really admired her for just like going, whoa, whoa, whoa now, you know, to a big, big company like ESPN. And they deleted the tweet. 
So, I mean, like Catherine touched upon it there. Do you feel a sense of community and, and support um, amongst female athletes kind of helping each other out, if you like? I feel like, to be honest, I don't know every sport. And I think that's, that's also like a thing where we all have to just try and get to know each other's sport. If I see it on TV, trust me, I'm watching it. Like, <laughs> I love the fact, like, I, I watch cricket all the time and I'm, no disrespect, but I'm a West Indies fan. But, <laughs> but I went to the Women's World Cup and I absolutely enjoyed myself. It was only, it was in, it was in England. So I was like, yeah, let's go, let's have fun. And I swear to God, that was like one of the best um, environments that I've been in because it's just so, it's just powerful that as a female athlete, watching other female athletes is just something that I think is admiring and you can just take things from there. Um, I don't think we do that enough, no. to be honest. Um, I think there is still more growth to do in that area um even like sort of calls like this you know getting to know different sports in one room is absolutely something that we don't do either in a regular basis and stuff like this is absolutely w wicked to to be involved because I don't know much about cricket but I know I like cricket and I love I, I've watched rugby I've never even I've only watched you Catherine because of the because of the Olympics, yeah. I watched that. I was like, yes, I'm with you. <laughs> but then like I obviously you got friends in other sports as well. So you do try and get each sport in there, but obviously with your schedule and their schedule, it don't really mix as much. But to be honest, as much as I can see women's sport on TV, the more I'm like, I'm all for our females. Yeah, I think you've like hit the nail on the head there. Cause I think we need to kind of almost stop trying to get men to watch women's sports and get women to watch women's sports because yeah. i think that you know stop stop young girls i don't know following reality tv stars or like get them to to follow women's sport emily do you kind of agree with that yeah 100 percent. and like just going back to the social media side of stuff like obviously rugby's had quite a few campaigns this year and people putting their head above the parapet a little bit um the enough hashtag that i care hashtag that sort of stuff that's come as a result of um, like negative trolling, the um, enough one was as a result of um, the island squad announcing their new jersey. The men, they used the male rugby players to model the men's jersey and they used female models to male, oh, yeah. male jersey. Um, and that kicked, kicked off, blew up. Um, it was awesome. It was awesome exposure for kind of the women's game, you know, the fantastic female, female rugby playing athletes that they have over in Ireland. Um, and to be fair, like Canterbury put their hands up, they apologised, blamed it on COVID as everybody does at the moment. And, and you know, things like that have changed. Um, and that's, that's awesome to see lots of, you know, sponsors and, and brands are, are using their female role models in a, in a really positive way. Um, the enough, uh, sorry, the I Care campaign was around the Six Nations. Obviously, we got cancelled um, because of COVID and stuff, um, and it got moved. And there's just reams and reams of people being like, "Who cares? Like, who cares?" And actually, then there was a massive response from the kind of women's rugby community, rugby community, um, just saying, "Well, I care. This is why I care. This is why." You know, parents stand up. Well, I care because my daughter watches them, supports them. I want them to see, you know, athletic, positive role models, not like you say, those reality stars or, or whatever. But yeah, I think rugby's definitely had a few, um, as I say, head of the parapet moments recently, which is, it's been really good. Um, it's definitely stirred the pot a little bit. It's definitely um, kind of, you know, putting ourselves out there. And in a predominantly male dominated sport, I think sometimes you have to do that. You have to kind of keep making sure that you're, you know, waving and reminding people that, that you are still here, you are putting a good product out there. Um, so yeah, hopefully that'll continue in a, in a positive way. Absolutely. Catherine, as chair of UK Sport, do you feel like there's, there's enough of that sense of community and support? And, and if not, maybe what needs to be done to, to make that better? Yeah, I think there's been some like amazing initiatives and there was, there was one that was, um, I don't know who created it in the first place, but, uh, there was three like World Cups coming up um, in 2017, 2018, 2019 between cr the Women's Cricket World Cup with the final Lords. In 2018 was the Women's Hockey World Cup back at Olympic Park in London. And then 2019 was the, could you now can say this, the amazing um, Netball World Cup in Liverpool. And the three sports got together 
in the lead up to the first one and kind of were like you know agreed to work together the three sports going to work together so at each event they promoted the other two sports and sort of said you know if you're going to enjoy this you know, wait till next year and you can go to the next one and there's these incredible sort of things of just rather than sport sometimes feel you know sometimes sport an individual sport can feel quite insular or can feel kind of quite separate or you know but we do our own thing um or competitive and that you know whether it's competing for money or sponsors or anything else there was an incredible uh support system of you know just if you know kind of the awareness and there's this incredible three years in a row you're going to see brilliant things happening and it was a really lovely link that you wouldn't normally put those three sports together but they were three brilliant sort of team sports for women all with you know in the uk big big global events coming and and it brought in you know people then as spectators as followers as fans suddenly if you if you if you normally were following cricket then you wanted to see what happened with the ho ne the the hockey and then at the hockey well, I want to see what happened with the, with the netball next and I think things like that are just so important that sports kind of use and benefit each other and and sort of raises everyone's profile at once together because you kind of you don't want every sport having to feel they have to fight their own fight mm. does it feel like that some, sometimes guys um I'm like Gideon, does it feel like you're you're kind of fighting your own fight sometimes Sometimes, for sure. I mean, as a as a sport that is predominantly just females, it is. There is no obviously we don't have a male side, but it's it's still growing to the point where I don't. I'm still trying to figure. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm not gonna lie. Like I'm not actually sure how it's gonna how we can mend it to to make sure we can still do all those things. Um, Tough one, isn't it? it is it's very tough like I, I i just like to see everyone just get together and it doesn't matter what sport it is and just you know promote each other from and exactly what um catherine just said with the whole world cup thing is that they promoted each other but then straight after that was finished did, did anyone promote anything else it's like do we do we now just because it's a big it's a big event i, I get that we need more spectators and we need more um people watching but we also need people watching and going further in the long run what yeah. does it just stop at 2019 that all world cup's done that's it well no there's other tournaments there's other competitions and no one else is still pushing for other sports and i think that's the part that we're getting wrong okay yeah because we because we need to we need, being role models you almost you need to build role models, don't you? You know that you, you need kids to see see you guys everywhere. Because as a child, I was surrounded by sport, you know, from a young age. But if I'm honest, my generation, I mean, we didn't have enough professional sports women to, to look up to or to, to want to emulate. And now as a mother of two, I'm so grateful to have, you know, you guys out there, you know, for, for our sons and our daughters. So Alex, as a female sports star, do you feel like you've got a responsibility to, to young girls to to be seen you know like Kadeem was saying you know to, to constantly be out there yeah yeah definitely I think I see my role is of trying to get the next generation of female cricketers so I sort of put myself out there and I'm quite um forward on social media because I want to be seen and I want to inspire and it sounds so cliche but I do want to inspire the next generation of cricketers especially now losing my England contract and and being okay and showing people that you don't have to play for England to earn a wage now in women's cricket you can just aim to play for your county your region and it is now professional yes it's not great money but it, it's something and in the past there's always been that well I can't earn money if I don't play for England and that's where it's changed so I think to inspire the next generation of cricketers may, maybe boys as well um I see as a as a massive role. Yeah, I guess that's when you're battling against, you know, gender get a pay gap, isn't it? And, and the men's sport. And you know, it's difficult then because that's a whole whole other conversation, isn't it, to be had. Yeah, and that that's a conversation that I keep putting out there and keep saying on podcasts and interviews that I'm a full-time cricketer, but on a part-time wage. <laughs> and it, I've got a mortgage and a car and a house to pay off and all this thing, and it doesn't pay the bills and I have to work as well as it. And people don't realize that yet but you know the men's minimum wage is a lot higher than the women's minimum wage so it'll get there I'm sure but it's it's average at the minute yeah I totally I totally agree with that like 
as much as obviously we can't even compare to a, a male a male side is that the fact that we all are we do a full-time program we are pretty much i'll say part-time but full-time some people in club yes we are getting a wage but it is barely scraping some bills like i i've got i've got the exact same thing mortgage car all them bills and i'm just thinking how am i doing it this month and what am i actually got left in order for me to you know have something for myself to even just be okay with mm -hmm. um and yeah it's it's like we're literally just scraping the barrel right at the moment and i don't think yes it is a definite conversation that still needs to be said and i think it still needs to be open enough that people are happy to talk about the fact that we're not at that stage yet so if we keep have i think you're doing great with your saying it on social media i mean i don't have the guts to do it but i think the more times people are saying it the more times people are getting it into their heads it's like feeding it in feeding it in the more things will might happen um so i'm just waiting for that change and i'm i actually agree with everything that you said Catherine, how far are we away do you think from from seeing that that change that alice and kadina hopefully you know will see during their careers ah uh. I don't know how do you put a, a time of day I think the a, a bit like you were saying with the the Simone Biles example of I think people are much more aware of being able to speak out about it and comment on about it and point it out when it's wrong and whether you know we saw it with the prize money in tennis and there's other you know there's big statement pieces being done about where equality can be done and how it can be pushed um I, you know I I've spent all my my sort of time in Olympic and Paralympic sport and it is different in there because there is it's not the sort of you know some of the, some of the traditional sports here you know, the professional sports have been so sort of male-led and male-dominated it's 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 the catching up game mm -hmm. um and and you know they say, they say the same with, with football as well football was here whereas a lot of the olympic Paralympic sports are you kind of don't tune in to watch sort of men swimming or or you know women's hockey or you know something like you might watch events but you you kind of watch the sport you don't you don't sort of at the olympics you don't differentiate the the, the male and female sides mm -hmm. so and and there's there's more sort of equality on that so i think it's the big steps that need to happen are are in the big sports we have here the big sort of you know the, the sort of the britain's big national team sports or are you know the football the cricket the golf tennis you know that some of the big ones are they that's where if rugby can shift it you know all the big ones that make such impact if what if and when that can be equalized then then it's a huge statement piece for sport I mean do you think that, that rugby are, are trying to to shift it do they are they trying hard enough look from when I first got capped from in 2008 we've come a hell of a long way but realistically I wouldn't even like to put a percent on you know what we earn compared to the blokes I think as Kadeem was saying it's it's amazing to hear how unaware people are so like I play for Loughborough Lightning I don't get paid to play for Loughborough Lightning that's my club we play in the women's premiership we're the top level of rugby in the in England um, my contract is because I'm centrally contracted to England uh, with 27 other girls around the country um, and just talking you know chatting to some of the guys or you know just people in normal life they have absolutely no idea that you go to Loughborough every day essentially and get nothing for it um, so I think there's yeah, there's there's so much work to be done. Um, I think obviously times at the moment are not <laughs> probably the right times to be really pushing that on. Um, I think you know certainly for us we're still grateful to be in a in a job. If I'm totally honest with you, so I think there's yeah we've got to make sure that we time it right. And I think for us our biggest thing at the moment is making sure that we've kind of got a leg to stand on. So we've got the Six Nations coming up. Go and win that, and then you're in a better place. We've got the World Cup after the summer. You know hopefully go and win that or do really well and you're in, again in a better place and I suppose it's that that bargaining power if you like if it's the right term to use um, but we've got to make sure that we're doing the stuff that we're paid to do on the field in order to then try and leverage more get more get our faces out there for sponsorship stuff because I think that's probably the biggest side of things at the moment in ways that that girls can probably earn a, a greater amount. Yeah um can I ask, Gary, who were your idols growing up? Were they were they male players or were they female players? Because I, I want to kind of bring a bit of positivity into this because I 100% now, okay, think that if you ask girls now, 
playing rugby, um, you know, they would have like you, Jessica Breach, you know, Shannon Brown, Katie Taylor McKee, Mo Hunt, to name but a few, to say they are my role models, they are who I'm, I'm looking up to. Um, like that's a massive step forward, right? And I know we've got a lot of work to do in terms of, you know, the gender pay gap, but you know, if, if we're clinging on to something, that is huge. It's massive. And I think like, I think Alex was saying earlier, like the girls appreciate that so much that it, that kind of brings such a massive um, part to, to why we're doing what we're doing. I, I didn't have a female role model growing up, not in rugby. Um, it was all about, you know, the male players that saw the Johnny Wilkinson's of the world and that kind of era. Um, I, I didn't have female role models. If I'm honest, I didn't know that I wanted to play for England or it was even a thing until I was about 16 years old because that was, I was part of a pathway that meant that I could, could see it was a thing. Um, so I, I think it's, it's awesome now that girls can see it on TV, they can see it all over social media, they can, you know, see these, as I say, positive female role models in rugby um, and now aspire to be, and they can aspire to be a professional rugby player. And I think that that's awesome. Like, it's genuinely something that I never thought would I'd be able to say, certainly in my career. Um, as I say, we want to push the domestic game on and, and try and, you know, continue to professionalise that. But, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I think we're all incredibly grateful for, you know, the opportunities and where we are at the moment while still having that kind of edge and that want to really push things on but yeah having young girls like tweet you instagram you saying you know i did this piece of homework on my sporting idol and it was you like that sort of stuff is just nuts it's mad <laughs> yeah because i think you know as emily touched upon i think you know like you know when for example england winning the rugby world world cup was a was a breakthrough i think i mean might disagree but a breakthrough for women's rugby so like for you you know the, the commonwealth you're a Commonwealth gold medalist. You've been part of a team, Crown BBC Sports Personality Team of the Year in 2018. Did did that period for you feel like it was a real breakthrough moment? Not not just for netball, but a little bit for for women's sport as well in general. I think it was definitely a, a history making moment in general. I think for a team who consistently were getting third position or fourth was a breakthrough so for to the nation and for us to be so far away from the nation as well is that we still we had all that um feeling that everyone was behind us no matter what sport and I think because they were seeing it and and maybe it's because it's on BBC where everything's free and everyone could see it is like okay it's on let's watch it okay, they're doing well, let's keep going. And everyone goes for the country, not necessarily the people. So when England sees England winning, everyone's all for England, no matter what sport. And I'm going to say that because I know when I watch football and England's winning and they're getting to semi-finals and to the finals, I'm like, come on, England, like, come on. Like, it doesn't matter what sport. And I think that's the difference between, like, obviously that is a major, a major competition. But then... Equally, I, as I said again, like domestically and, you know, just normal internationals, no one necessarily goes for that, that sport. I think, yes, it was a breaking moment for um, the nation to finally believe that netball is a sport in general. But then after that, it, the Netball World Cup happened and that was an, a next buzz. And then it died only because... You know, yes, COVID hit, but it, it just slowly started dying um, and it weren't necessarily there. So I say it's picking up again only because we, we've, we've finally got accessibility for people to watch. But yeah, when I, oh, it is a difficult one, but like when it comes to like role models and stuff, like I didn't have any role models in netball because I didn't see it as often on TV. So I didn't, I didn't, until I was in the team, I, I didn't really see um, who I could become. Mm -hmm. um, but I was always following Serena Williams. Like she's, I think she's the number one GOAT in the world. And I don't, I had, and I don't know who has done anything that she's done, come with a baby, come back, <laughs> everything else. She I don't know. That goat thing. <laughs> as I was saying, I think she needed to be on that. Yeah, like 100%. Um, for everything that she's done, amazing grand slams, everything that that is inspiring to watch and irrelevant if it's an individual sport, you want to be that one person for yourself individually to be the best that you can be. And I, I just personally just 
that woman's just the best. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, as, 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 you know, going on that point, as, as, a, as a female athlete, okay, um, does it, does, is it always in the back of your mind, Catherine, that, you know, right, I, I've, you know, I've, I've got to do this, I've got a responsibility to young girls, because I don't know, do, do men think like that? Like, so I don't know, is it, how different is it for, for women athletes? Because men probably just think, yeah, I'm going to go out there and I want to win, I want to do well, but for women, is it different? I, I, I can't answer for every female athlete, but I think, um, and Emily said it really well, you know, it really is, it's a massive privilege when you become aware of that, because I don't think any of us start off in our, our sporting careers or anything thinking, I'm going to be a role model. You know, that's not what you aim to be, you know, it's not what you're, you should be aiming for. It's not what you want to be. You kind of want to be good at your sport and you want to be competitive and you want to see how far you can get. And you kind of realise in the way of doing that and the style of doing it and the success you get, then you start having influence and impact. And, you know, like we will all have had, you get messages from, you know, girls and schools and, and, you know, boys as well, people from all different age groups kind of contacting or letting you know where they've done, you know, they've done school projects or they've done, I don't know. They, I mean, like anyone having done something and sort of saying you inspired me in some way, I, what you've done has really, you know, impacted me and reached you. And then you sort of realise what you thought was kind of your personal ambition or drive or wanting to make a difference in your own way has a reach that or certainly for me had a reach that I had absolutely no idea. I would no kind of, you know, I didn't think it would, you know, I was in a sport that well, I said most people didn't know women could do for a long time. And, uh, and even, you know, unless you were a fan of rowing, you, you know, you see once every four years, that's, that's when, when you see it and that's it. So we kind of, you know, you don't really uh, think you're going to have this impact on people's lives. Um, so when you realise you are, then I think very quickly you respond in a kind of, this, this is an amazing privilege and an amazing opportunity. And in that way, I'm going to do everything I can to, you know, in what I do as, as my career to make a positive impact. And, and again, it's, it's not just being successful, but it's the style, you, you know, the, the kind of behaviours you, you are and the the platform you have and you know like Alex if you're if you're comfortable and happy on social media you can have an incredible incredible reach on people's lives and really positively so I'm sure some of the male athletes feel the same I'm sure they do feel some weight of responsibility but um, I think it's brilliant seeing so many more girls so many more young women getting involved in so many different sports now and feeling it is for them and I think that's because of like brilliant people on this call who have made you know got it to the very top of their sport and are sharing that with other people now but i think then once you get them there i suppose it's, it's another thing then isn't keeping keeping them engaged um you know obviously mentioned covid there it's been tough on everyone hard on male female professional athletes you know not to mention youngsters alex um how and this is a big question um how do we help ensure girls to stay engaged with sport and physical activity at times when perhaps i don't know they're most at risk of losing interest um, I think for me, it's enjoyment. And as long as you're letting kids enjoy the sport that they're playing, they, they're going to stick at it. As soon as a teenage girl, let's say, has the opportunity to go out with her mates on the weekend or play a sport that she's not necessarily enjoying because the coach is being too harsh or the coach is telling her she needs to lose weight or whatever it is, she's going to end up choosing to go out with her mates. So I think you need to keep kids and teenagers engaged and especially women, I think, it's massive you know I, I've had it in in my sport when I lost my contract I wasn't enjoying it and that's why I ended up falling out of love with the game so I think as long as people remember why they started and that's enjoyment then I think that's how you keep people engaged yeah and getting them started I, I like when I when I knew I was doing this uh, webinar I kind of looked up a few statistics and only eight percent of girls between 11 and 18 and meeting the recommended hour of daily activity, 8%. And I think only 14% like of boys, I mean, that that's not enough, is it, across both genders? And, and partly maybe because Alex, of what you're saying, you know, I, I, that stage you get to in your life where I don't know, you know, the opposite sex becomes uh, attractive or you want a girlfriend or you want a boyfriend or you're going out partying or it's like, I don't know, it's, it, it's difficult, isn't it, to keep um, youngsters and, and particularly maybe the girls girls engaged did any of you kind of go through that period as like teenagers or young women um I never necessarily went through that stage I think everything for me was always in sport from a young age so I just knew sport but seeing like me like my sister she she started her business solo sessions and 
with we had an Inspire um, program which engages ages 11 to 14, um, just because that is the ages that we get the most drop-offs in netball. Um, that is not necessarily because they don't love the game. It's because they there's not enough clubs around. There's depending on how, you know how you live. It's it's always like the community stuff is the hard bit because more the more times you get to a bigger not say bigger but when you progress in your sport the more money that has to go in um not everyone has that not everyone has the support not every parent has a car not every you have to then travel to i don't know sheffield and then you live in london like these things are so accumulating why we get so much drop off because not every sport what well, what i know with netball in general is that all the sport happens up north like every camp is always going up north i always think where's the london lot like i'm from london i don't like traveling like that but because my mum drove she was like we're going get in the car we're gonna drive four hours to get there um but then there's people who are potentially the same the same amount of um ability that i have and could potentially be as good and or even better is that they just don't have a car because they can't get there or they don't have enough money to get on the train or do you know what I mean? So like there's the drop off is not just about the enjoyment. Yes, that's one thing, but it's also accumulating of other things where we have to help the community that doesn't have enough. Like there's not enough um, sports centers that have netball courts. It's always a basketball court, a badminton court. Where's the netball court? They're like, well, you're an outdoor sport. Well, we can vary that because we we do in and out um so it's like it's so much to weigh up when it comes to the drop off and it's just hard to get people engaged as much as they want because of how they live or they just can't get there and and, and it's just it's just a tough it's a tough one but you have to engage as much as possible and that's why we started the inspire program in order to keep keep them engaged and to see people who came from the exact same area as them and know that you can make it no matter what and I think that's the part that I don't think everyone does at the exact like you know in that little drop-off area so we're trying to do that inspire and go forward um and it was happening it was getting so much it was getting so good until COVID hit <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I know it's hard. It, it is hard, isn't it? Uh, Emily, do you go along with what QG says there? Because I guess it's different for rugby because there are rugby pitches everywhere. There are, but I guess in your sense, there weren't any women's rugby teams. So, in, in, and you had to travel maybe for that. Does, could you kind of compare maybe? Yeah, it's very similar, slightly different reasons. Yeah, I think um, rugby, obviously, being outdoor, you don't always need kind of the plushest pitches and actual posts and things it's kind of throw a jumper down kind of that old school football vibe to an extent I think for me one of the biggest things especially with rugby I, I want to get it in schools like and that doesn't have to be full contact rugby it can be a touch version it can be a tag version whatever version that is I think um, I was very lucky the school I went to I was able to do loads of different sports never played rugby but I was able to do loads of different sports I was able to experience lots of different things and then I could almost like cherry pick what I really enjoyed um, and I think unfortunately lots of young boys and girls get kind of pigeonholed into the two sports that their school does and they don't really unless like Dean said they've got parents that can take them places or they've found other sports clubs um, in their area they don't really ever get to kind of broaden their horizons with things like that and I think I worked for a little bit in schools I worked in the community program um, and actually introducing rugby to girls I there weren't many that said they hated it. All, loads of their faces lit up. They loved it. Um, you know, you can play it in a version. It's What's like about it, Emily? What's not like not to like about rugby? Do you know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. <laughs> Other than when it's cold, and I would definitely <laughs> agree with people. But um, yeah, exactly. I think, you know, as I say, a lot of people are put off by contact. And so I kind of tiptoed when I was coaching it in schools. I tiptoed around the contact thing. And the girls were like, miss, miss, why aren't we, why aren't we like hitting each other? And I was like, all right, here we go. And they loved it. Um, and I think just giving people the, the menu, if you like, letting them experience all those things and then they, then they can pick, it's up to them. They're not going to like everything. I didn't like everything. That's, you know, it's unrealistic, but actually, you know, giving them, as I say, that menu and then hopefully 
there's something that they can pick up from that, whether they want to go on and play for England or whether they just pick something up that can be really sociable for them, help them with an active lifestyle, you know, promote positive body image, all of that sort of stuff. That's brilliant. I'm going to follow on from that, actually, because um, you guys, um, each of you have touched upon this topic um, so far today already. But I'd like to chat about how we kind of change platforms for women to make it you know, easier um, to, to, to speak up, to, to play their sport. I found a great quote. Um, you can have all these, by the way, my stats and quotes, you can reuse them, um, from um, activist Marion Wright Elderman. And, and she was saying that you can't be what you can't see. And it's, I know it's so true, isn't it? Catherine, women make up 40% right, of all participants in sport, yet they receive only 4% of, of media sports coverage. And, and I know you guys have touched upon this already, but from the public perception, it seems like women's sport um, is getting more coverage and the right sort of coverage. But as professional sports women, do you feel like, like, like this is the case? Yeah, I guess I think we've talked, touched on a bit earlier. Like, I think there's been huge progress. I think, you know, there ha things have definitely changed in all our, our sort of careers and lifetimes. Um, but you just feel, there's a there's a long way to go yet you know there's, there's kind of no complacency in it you you kind of I suppose the more progress you do the more you see there are still a lot of a lot of play a lot further to go for in a lot of different areas for women's sport um and I think you know we've also touched quite a lot on the big events are the hooks mm. so the world cups you know the six nations the 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 ashes the kind of the really big events or where the public switches on and does get into it. And, and whether it's men's sport or women's sport, I really think they get in tune when it's the big kind of national, international events. And I think that the, it feels the unfortunate challenge right now for women's sport is kind of in between. Mm -hmm. it, it goes to nothing. And, and you know, and I haven't really touched on it before, there's this feeling of, I think it's just lack of knowledge, lack of awareness. People wouldn't realise that women play club sport and have to do it for free. People wouldn't realise you can have contracts and not get paid enough to pay bills. And people wouldn't think that actually, you know, there were national leagues happening in women's sport because, you know, every week you can read about the men's equivalent. So I think there's still a real lack of understanding and awareness. And while that exists, a lot of day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year women's sport sits a bit below the radar. And then the big events bring it back up and everyone gets very, very excited. And then it dips again. And it's it's this real challenge of how do you constantly have it in people's attention and awareness so that people are hooked and people are following it and people are interested. That brings the sponsors, that brings the TVs, you know, all that kind of stuff spirals upwards when it's working, but can quickly spiral downwards when it's not. And I think we've seen through COVID women's sport be hit particularly hard by not getting sort of airtime because it's not been able to happen. Alex, I know the answer to this question, but um, are we seeing enough cricket, women's cricket? On telly, you're like it? No, no I, I think the England girls are out in New Zealand now um, and there's no radio coverage. coverage. Um, and I think if that was a, a men's series, there would be radio coverage. I think it wouldn't have even been talked about. Somebody would just go. Um, and you sort of think, are the ECB doing enough to cover the women's coverage because the men are playing as well? So there's not as, not as much tweets going out in the in the night because it's the middle of the night and the person that's meant to be working on it isn't working on it because his time is suited better elsewhere but you know that that's that shouldn't be the case if it was a men's thing these things would not even be negotiated you know you would cover the men's game as well as you could to the best of your ability no matter if it's three o'clock in the morning but just because the women are playing at three o'clock in the morning oh you know what we'll wait we'll wait till tomorrow it'll be fine it must be so frustrating it is it's something I'm really I, it really gets me going it really annoys me and you could probably tell but I just think the more people you want to get involved in a sport so the ECB are saying they want more people to play cricket we'll cover it more put it more put it out there more because if you go on the ECB's Instagram Twitter they don't tweet about the girls as much as they do about the boys so people aren't going to see it what about brands Alex you know like yeah, your Adidas is and your, you know, just brands in general. Are they promoting like women's sport, female athletes enough? I think they promote individual sports a lot better than team sports. Right. So I think individual sport, so your sprinters, let's say, and your athletics, they sort of get promoted a lot more than, than your team sport. Um, if, a, if Nike, let's say, sponsor a team, 
you would see their men's side a lot more than you would see their women's side. And mm. Kadeem, um, what are Sky Sports done for, for, for netball in Britain? How much has that coverage lifted your, your profile as a team and as individuals? I would say the growth like for this season has been massive. Um, the fact that this season is the first season ever in fifth no is it 15 or 15 16 seasons that we've had already is that this is the first season we've got all games on sky sports and if if it's not on tv it's on the youtube channel um mm. so this is like a very new thing <laughs> i'm in a very new everyone's seen every game like there's going to be more criticisms there's going to be more you know more people you know, getting involved because they're not necessarily involved in the sport themselves because of COVID. Um, I think we still got a hell of a lot of way to go. Um, I think the only reason why it's happening now is because we're all in a central venue. Um, okay. If this was in everyone's home ground, everyone's going home in a way, would we have the same coverage? Uh, I would say no. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful at the moment and for this year and what how the year has come and everything else is that I'm grateful that everyone can see every game and I'm not going to say no to that I'm like put it on your tv put it on your on your phones whatever I don't care thank god we've got that and it's free <laughs> so there's no complaining when it comes to YouTube it's free so there's no complaining when people say no I can't afford Sky I can't afford this this is the stuff that we try and get out so often that it's i know you want more netball we know you want it out there well it's free now you have like it is your chance to watch it so and i think after, after seeing yeah, like, that people hooked isn't it that's when yeah. you come into someone for free absolutely. It, and then they'll keep watching it absolutely um like i've been watching like the views of each game and obviously when it comes to the it is slightly like the bigger teams versus the, the teams that some people don't necessarily know as much. Um, you see, like at the moment, there's over 25,000 people watching that one game at the time live. And I think that is something that I've never seen them numbers before. So I'm just grateful that it's happening. We still got more. I want to see what next season will look like. Would we have more coverage when we go home and away? Because, you know, we're going to go back to normality. Um, so that's the bit that I would like to see is the next bit after this whole um, COVID situation. Yeah. I think that, that shows Sky's commitment to women's sport as well, because they put most of the cricket on and on YouTube. And I think that's massive that they're showing they want to grow women's sport because they're providing it for free as well. And they don't do that with men's sport. So that's something that's niche and something that is a positive that's coming out of it as well. Absolutely. Okay, guys, can I, this is kind of on a lighter note, right? Because I want to speak to you about, um, about something today that, um, that I read a couple of weeks ago, actually. How adverse are you guys to the term lady? Right, let me explain, okay? Because I'm talking about an article I read um, where a BBC journalist asked um, if she was the only one that would remove all mention of the word ladies in women's sport. So now it is the opinion, apparently, that using ladies is overtly gender marking and screams physical um, fragility, I guess, and reinforcing the sexist stereotypes. So, discuss. Because I guess it's kind of true, because we wouldn't use, would we, like, gentlemen's rugby? We wouldn't say, we'd say men's rugby. We wouldn't go gentlemen's 100 metres. we say men's 100 metres. But yet we say ladies draw at Wimbledon. But so, then we get annoyed when they say girls. So if you... Well, yeah. So, I mean, we are girls we are ladies i i personally i'm i'm quite happy being called a batsman because it's that's just what it is it's a, like i don't think i should be called a batswoman like or a bat like batter is fine um i don't i don't see an issue with it really yeah and emily what about you is it is it would you want to be called you know because it's, it's all in rugby it's always been man of the match hasn't it so does that kind of bother you would you would you want to be called woman of the match lady of the match Star of the match? It's all very good questions. Um, <laughs> the amount of people I've seen get in a fluster when they either are introducing you or trying to figure out what you do that go from women's to ladies to girls rugby player really quickly and like spin out about it because they're not sure what they should be saying. It's quite it's quite funny, but yeah, I'm a little bit the same boat. I'm, I'm not too bothered. Um, I think, I guess, 
if we're promoting, just trying, I guess, trying to keep it consistent. Like we generally get referred to as women's rugby players. Um, I guess it's it's different to people's language, isn't it? Naturally, you know, I would probably use the word woman more. My gran would probably use the word ladies more. It's like, you know, it's like anything. People use different language sometimes. So yeah, I'm not too bothered. I think for the, the whole man of the match thing, I think we've been going with like player of the match, just yeah. kind of gender neutralizing that, that situation. And actually that can then go across men and, and women's games. Um, because that's what you are. You're a player and you've just got player of the match. So look, yeah, it, it's not something I get my hair in too much of a spin about, if I'm totally honest with you. But um, yeah, it is quite funny. What the journalist did, though. She was properly annoyed. Catherine, I, I don't know, are we looking at something in too much detail here? Or is it an... Is well, it a, I don't... I guess you consider everything else we've discussed. I feel there's much bigger issues to get right, <laughs> if I'm honest. Uh, and I suppose, yes, you know... A bit like they're talking about, we talk about women's rowing and men's rowing and then rowing. So I think the men's and women's equivalent is fine. I don't think I've ever been described as ladies rowing and because I wouldn't be described as a lady. So uh, that's fine. Um, dame, no. well, yeah, I think a dame's even, I don't know that where that comes in in the ladies list. But, you know, and then you get ladies day at Ascot and there's a sort of, there's, you know, there's sort of gentility around the word lady, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it, it wouldn't, doesn't keep, that one doesn't keep me awake at night, I have to say. Yeah. I'm glad to hear. I just thought I'd put it out there because I just found it when I was reading it. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't quite know what to think of it. Um, right, let's, let, let's kind of wrap it up then with, with, with a few kind of final questions because we, we've discussed so many interesting things today and I feel like I want to kind of condense it into this last section. Um, we've spoken about, you know, the growth of women's sport, Catherine, the, the positive experience, some negative experiences um, you guys had and are still having. Um, after everything we've spoken about, what still needs to be done? <laughs> More this is the, female in the media. There you go. Dimples. <laughs> it, it kind of does boil up down to that though, doesn't it? Because everything kind of like escalates from that, doesn't it? See, see more female athletes and then everything else. Hopefully. I think it's not even just about seeing it. I think it's like, you know, like the little adverts, like I'm not even joking. I can know that a footballer is going to do a Gillette advert every time. <laughs> but why is it that there's not one thing with sure, we can just spray a sure. Do you know what I mean? Like Venus, you know, we, we can do it too. We got a shaving thing too. Like, <laughs> again, it's like, just get athletes. Like they're not, just get female athletes to do more of those that people can see them on a regular basis outside of their actual sport and then promote it even more when it comes to their sport as well. And mm -hmm. I, I genuinely think it's everything to do with the media because everyone's in their phone, on TV, and especially in this time of COVID situation for the whole entire year, that's all people have been watching. And that's the thing that we've been lacking. And yeah. that's where we have to move forward from. Is there, is there anything we've kind of left out, guys? Is any any kind of ideas or suggestions as to, as to what, what still needs to be done that we haven't touched upon yet tonight? Do you know, I think one of the things, and I just take it to the other end, because I think we're talking about, you know, role models, big names, big faces having a huge impact, which is definitely, definitely important. But we touched it very briefly. I don't think we've got school sport right. I don't think, you know, you're talking about the number of young people taking part in activity you know, it drives me mad because you think we know the benefits of sport. You know, there's, there's sort of scientifically proven benefits from all the health stuff that you get from it, all the that's physical health, all the mental health stuff you get from it. I mean, increasingly mental health is so important and sport can have a positive impact. All the sort of socialization aspects, the, the playing with others bit of sport at young developing age, it's so important. And there's, you know, Kadina was talking about, there's increasing, you know, challenges for a lot of families who, cannot always provide outside of school hours, you know, the ability to take people to clubs or to drive them around the country. And you feel, you know, I think that's what's changed in, in certainly my lifetime and our careers is school sports seems to have just got worse and the time given to it and the, you know, the accessibility and, and you know, if you can, you know, there are certain schools you could access that probably you have to pay for that have, will have incredible facilities, but the other end of the scale, you know, kids are really losing out. And I think, you know, all that we talk about, about, you know, hopefully having brilliant national teams with brilliant women being great role models, it has to start at the other end. It has to start at people throwing around football, rugby balls and kicking footballs and, you know, having cricket bats and having netballs and 
all that really basic stuff you do as a kid because you love it and you want to try it and you want to see how it can go that's where it begins for all of us and I just don't think that's a huge frustration of we're not I don't think we've got that right and I think we just see then challenges all the way through. In your role at UK Spoke Catherine is that something that you know you guys are trying to change and to and to help? Yeah well we're limited UK Sport can only um, support the Olympic and Paralympic level so we're very high performance end of, of the sporting chain <laughs> Um, but you know I work as we all will do I work with a lot of young people and charities and stuff that really help to support getting involved at that age because you just you just I mean it's like all of us we've all had brilliant experiences in sport and you just want as many people as possible who want to try it to get the opportunity to wherever they take it to it can be a really positive part of people's lives and I just it it frustrates me it frustrates me to to have young people (laughs) feeling they can't do that yeah, it's just like what you, Emily, were saying, wasn't it? Once, once the girls in school tried rugby, they loved it. Yeah. It's giving them that chance to try it. Yeah, exactly. And then, then you've got to put in place the pathway to a club or to the local community or whatever that is. But yeah, essentially, schools are a massive um, like playground, obviously, but playground in terms of what they're able to do there as well. Um, and it takes the teachers, it takes probably upskilling the teachers because they're probably grew up playing football, grew up playing hockey, and that's all that they can now kind of deliver and they don't really look outside of that. So I think, yeah, education for the teachers in terms of what they're able to deliver, just offering stuff. I remember playing lacrosse at school, which I'd never come across before. As I say, I was really fortunate at the school I was at, but I loved it. It didn't make me want to go and be a lacrosse player, but I loved it nonetheless and it it could have done. Um, So yeah, it's just giving that exposure to those people, Um, yeah. Okay, and one line from you all to finish then. This might be a bit of a hospital pass, actually, but I'm going to throw it at you anyway. Um, right, what did you want your legacy to be for future generations? Ah, that's a good one, right? Do you need some time to think about it? <laughs> Who's going to be brave enough to answer that first? I'll go first then. Go on then, you go. I'd, I'd like future generations to feel that anything is possible. Brilliant. I think that's what you know that's what we'd all like isn't it it's, it's not just as females but you know as as parents as it's um yeah yeah can we leave it there <laughs> <laughs> does anybody else want to try your better yeah that? you can't say that's what i was gonna say you can't say that go on <laughs> um mine, mine would be when times get tough and things don't go right remember why you started and and that's because you enjoyed it Oh, I like this part of the webinar. <laughs> two down, two to go. I'm glad I went first. It's going to get harder. <laughs> um, I would say potentially don't let anyone tell you that you can't do nothing because you can. And that is the vital ingredient to success is that you know that you can. Brilliant. Love it. And I, I, would, I would just mash together the three, I think. <laughs> um, yeah no look I think for me it's like my experience is like I'm unbelievably proud to be a woman playing sport and I think I can't convey that feeling to others but I would just love other people to be able to feel that guys thank you so much for your time today it's been it's been brilliant to talk to you I hope you guys have enjoyed as well thanks for your like insights your stories and, and all your advice and um, enjoy the rest of International Women's Day um, and uh, and if anyone watching this wants more information on any of the subjects we've discussed, then please uh, contact the RPA. The information should be on your screens now. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.